Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. So, we will present about the special constitutional status of Malays and the native of Sabah and Sarawak. And we will also further explain about its significance and implementation from Merdeka until today and also the current challenges. So, the group members consist of me, Hanis Hazika, Badrina Shafia, Asia, and also Ainul Mardia. First of all, for the historical background, I will explain from the establishment of Malayan Union, Federation of Malaya Agreement, Alliance Party, Red Commission, the Working Party, and lastly, the formation of Federal Constitution. Okay, so the history of the Malaysian constitutions basically began even before the British intervention into the Malay Peninsula. At that time, Malacca already had codified laws such as Hukum Kanun Malacca and Undang-Undang Laut Malacca. In Hukum Kanun Melaka consists of various chapters such as criminal offences, commercial transactions, family matters, matters of evidence and proceedings, and also the condition of ruler. Other states such as Terengganu and Johor also had their own constitution. During the process of achieving independence, approximately in 1946, the British had introduced Malayan Union in order to unify the Malay states under a single government so that they could have a better administration system. The English colonies in London had set up a rule to replace the rule introduced by the British army without having discussion with the Malay rulers and also the Malays. However, Malay people opposed the principle of Malayan Union since it had disregarded the position of the Malays and Malay rulers. They could not accept the establishment of the principle of Jusoli where a person's nationality at birth is determined by the place of birth and also there was an erosion of sovereignty of the Malay ruler's power through the formation of the unitary government. Due to the criticism on Malayan Union, the British then introduced the Federation of Malaya Agreement on 1st February 1948. The objective was to propose a new constitutional framework to replace the Malayan Union. As a result, every Malay state started to have their own constitutions even though Johor and Terengganu already had their own constitution earlier. However, in order to conform with the requirements of FMA, the existing constitutions had been modified by introducing the concept of constitutional monarchy, whereby the Malay rulers need to act on advice. Basically, the creation of FMA was a stepping stone to the process of independence. There are few basic features of the federation, but unfortunately, the third feature has been delayed due to communist defiance. So, there was an emergence of the alliance party that consisted of AMNO, MIC and also MCA. They had won in the general election held in 1955, which gave a clear mandate for the Malays to continue urging for independence of Malaya and facilitating the preparation of their own constitution. After that, a conference was held in London to agree on the proposition of independence and to appoint a constitutional commission to draft the constitution of Malaya. Hence, it could be said that the independence talk in London was a landmark event in the making of independent Tanah Melayu. The establishment of the Constitutional Commission, or better known as Red Commission, was vital to clearly define the framework of constitutional monarchy and also to draft the constitution. There were a total of 118 conferences held and they had received 131 memoranda submitted by the political parties, organizations and also the public. In February 1957, the first draft of the constitution was submitted by the committee which had led to various responses and series of discussions to evaluate the content. However, the proposal was not accepted and criticized by various ethnic groups and also by the Malay rulers. They were unhappy with the citizenship matter, the temporary special position of the Malays, unofficial status of the usage of Chinese language, restriction on Malay reservation land, unmentioned religion to the federation, conference of rulers were made symbolic and lastly the imbalance of power between the federal and also the state government. Therefore, the tripartite working party was appointed to further examine the Red Commission report and few changes had been made with regards to the aforementioned issues. It could be seen that the establishment of the Malayan Union until the working party had led to the formation of the current basic legal framework, namely the federal constitution. Moving on to the question of special constitutional status of the Malays, a similar provision in the Red Commission Report was enacted in Article 153 of the Federal Constitution, which says why DPA is responsible to safeguard the special position of the Malays and natives of Sabah and Sarawak. And this is due to the fear that a large number of non-Malays obtaining citizenship after Merdeka, the Chinese who are economically more powerful, would come to dominate the Malays. Hence, it is important that Article 153 may not be amended without the consent of the Conference of Rulers, 
Despite the freedom of speech embodied in Article 10, the clause 4 allows the government to prohibit anyone from questioning any matter, right, status, position, privilege or sovereignty of the Malays and it is even illegal to question or discuss the sensitive issues anywhere, either in public, state legislature or even in the parliament and those guilty may be liable for the Sedition Act 1970. Article 153 Clause 2 empowers the YDPA to ensure the reservation for Malays of proportion in the public service, scholarships, exhibitions, and other similar educational or training privileges or special facilities. And Clause 3 also provides that the YDPA may make a reservation of quotas for the Malays for all the things mentioned just now. This is for the sake of bringing the Malays up educationally and economically, which had been a concern ever since before Merdeka and until now. Because of the imbalance of racial composition of students in the universities, Clause 8A was inserted in Article 153 and an amendment Article 12, Clause 4, despite going against Article 12 that says there shall be no discrimination against any race in education, because the new clause makes it lawful for the YDPA to give directions to any universities or college to ensure of the reservation quota system for the Malays. When it comes to Malay reservations, Article 89 provides that any language immediately before independence was a Malay reservation may continue as a Malay reservation. And Article 88, 89, Clause 2, then states that any land which is not a Malay reservation and has not been developed or cultivated may also be declared as a Malay reservation. Article 90, on the other hand, also provides the special provisions relating to customary land in Negeri Sembilan and Melaka and Malay holdings in Terengganu. The reason behind this is to prevent state land in Malay reservation area from being disposed of by any means to the non-Malays and to prevent any private dealings between Malay and non-Malays in terms of Malay holding or Malay reservation land. It is significant to cite what Abdul Malik Ishak J said in the case of Mutama Anak Pembaik of Indian and Master Ingrid bin Muhammad and another who stated that the Malays reservation enactments is to protect the Malays in regard to their interest in their land owned by them. Hence, any dealing, disposal or attempt to deal in or dispose of Malay reserve land in contravention of the Malay reservation enactments of the respective Malay states are rendered null and void under the respective enactments. Even the attachment and execution of any Malay reserve land or holding owned by a Malay is strictly prohibited. However, Article 153, even from the surface, would invite many criticisms from the non-Malays which had resulted in dissatisfaction and increase of racial issues among the society. As Malaysia is a multinational country, however, Article 153 has created conflict dynamics between the Malays and the non-Malays when the government grants special privileges to Malays. One of the common concerns was the parents of the non bumi Putra students who questioned the lessening opportunities for their children to attend local universities, which most of them would end up being denied admission despite being more than qualified. And because of this, they lost the opportunity to further their study, especially for those who can afford to go abroad to study. Furthermore, despite Malaysia wanting to be a big contributor in global markets, however, due to the Ethnic Preferential Policies Act has caused the Malays to become overly dependent on the state, which has caused Malaysia to lose the sense of competitiveness in the international market. Despite this fact, it is undeniable that the reality of today's economy revealed otherwise where the non malays are the ones who dominate the economic opportunity and the wealth distribution in our country. Due to corruption issues practiced by our own people, such as the one reported by the Anti-Corruption Commission regarding the government department's complicit in a multi-billion ringgit Malaysia project and the cattle, cases like this has failed the government's effort to improve the economic lives of Bumi Putra through affirmative action plans as this issue greatly affected Bumi Putra contractors the most. Because of this, it is getting harder to implement the policies under the new Economic Policy 1970 as well as being potential threats to the Shared Prosperity Vision 2030. Moreover, there was also a new group of thinkers called as Ultra Kiasu or Malay Liberalists who always raised sensitive racial issues and opposed Malay supremacy. They believed that Article 153 should be abolished on the grounds of democracy, equality and concept of fair and square from the West. Alright, now we'll be moving on to the special constitutional status of the natives of Sabah and Sarawak. Sabah and Sarawak were previously given special status under the constitution which gave them special authority which are not provided to the other state in order to prevent them from being left out after combining with the peninsula in 1963. And under part 12A in federal constitution is entirely devoted to the additional safeguard for Sabah and Sarawak and some other men matters that have been mentioned which to preserve the use of english and native languages in courts and parliaments uh, which mentioned in article 161 other than that also can grant the two states the right to veto constitutional amendments which uh, are mentioned in article 161a and last but not least also uh, provided in article 161e regarding the safeguards and protection for constitutional position of sabah and sarawak 
Each provision under Part 12A have their own functions to protect all the native in Sabah and Sarawak. First and foremost, we will be focusing on the use of English and native language in the state of Sabah and Sarawak, which have been mentioned in Article 161. This provision has provided the opportunity of the using of English and native languages in the states of Sabah and Sarawak. As stated in Article 152 of the Federal Constitution, it was decided that the Malay language has become the national language of our country. However, it was also provided that no person should be prohibited from using other languages, including the use of English and native language by the natives of Sabah and Sarawak, which have been mentioned in Article 161. And in Clause 2 of the provision provided that a member who is from the state of Sabah and Sarawak may use the English, lang English language in both houses of parliament and there will be uh, no miscommunication between the representative. Therefore, they may deliver their needs in the parliament clearly. And moreover, the use of English language may be applied for proceeding in the High Court in Sabah and Sarawak or in any lower court in the Borneo, such as subordinate courts as well as the superior courts. And last but not least, in paragraph C, mentioned that English language may be used in the Borneo in the Legislative Assembly or for other official purposes, including purpose of the federal government. Right next, the special position of native of state of Sabah and Sarawak will have been mentioned in Article 161A of the Federal Constitution. This provision has provided that the constitution of the state of Sabah and Sarawak may be modified in accordance with the Article 161A to include the provision comparable to Article 153, which have been mentioned regarding the position in the public service uh, and scholarship, exhibition, and other similar education or training privileges or special facilities that are given by the federal government to the Malays and the native of Sabah and Sarawak. Therefore, the State Legislative Assembly from Sabah and Sarawak may amend their constitution to modify the provision by referring to the Article 161A Clause 4, which are suitable to implement for the native in Sabah and Sarawak as they have the right to get the reservation according to what has stated in Article 153. In Article 161A Clause 5 provided that Article 89 of the Federal Constitution we mentioned about Malay Reservation cannot be applied to the state uh, to the native of Sabah and Sarawak as it is only applied to the Malays. But Article 8 had given the right for the native of Sabah and Sarawak which enabled for them to acquire the reservation of land or giving them preferential treatment. As in Article 8 had clearly mentioned that there shall be no discrimination against citizens. Last but not least, the safeguards for the constitutional position of state of Sabah and Sarawak have been mentioned in Article 161E of the Federal Constitution. Basically, this article has the function to protect the rights of the natives in every aspect such as the equity treatment which they deserve to acquire. In clause to other Article 161E of the Federal Constitution, state that the constitution cannot be amended without the concurrence of the Yang Di Pertuan Negeri of the state of Sabah and Sarawak which can affect the operation of the constitution regarding some matters. And the methods mentioned in the provision include the right of the person who were born before the Malaysia day to obtain their own citizenship as they deserve to get equal treatment as the person who reside in the state of Maya. And furthermore, other matters that have been brought up in the provision are regarding the constitution and jurisdiction of the High Court in Sabah and Sarawak in terms of the appointment and uh, removal and suspension of the judges of the court. And the matters about the legislature of the state in making laws, the religion in the state and the language used, and the special treatment for the natives are fully discussed in Article 161E of the Federal constitution. Right, there is a case that can be portrayed which is the case of Stephen Kalong Lincoln and Government of Malaysia in 1968, which uh, this case was about the plaintiff in his statement of claim. Firstly, claimed that the proclamation of state of emergency that made by Yang Di Pertuan Agong was now void and not effect by reason of the fact that it was not made bona fide but was made in a fraudulent legis. And secondly, the plaintiff argued that the Emergency Federal Constitution and Constitution of Sarawak Act 1966 of the Parliament of Malaysia was now void and had an effect because of the power of the Parliament to make law under Article 150. Clause 5 was limited by Article 161E. And the federal court had decided that the governor of Sarawak's consent does not appear to be required because Article 79 stated that any amendment to such a bill is not required any consent. Moving on to the current challenges faced to the native of Sabah Sarawak with special constitutional status. There are few concerns that lead to the people's discontentment in the two bonus states. 
which is the first one, is the failure of the central government to ensure the level of autonomy agreed upon in Malaysia Agreement 1963 and the failure to deliver on economic growth. Their constitution had already granted Sabah and Sarawak with special status, conferring specific power to Sabah and Sarawak that are not available to the other state, such as the power to restrict non-resident from entering Sabah and Sarawak. And the constitution also devoted an entire section to the additional protection for Sabah and Sarawak. Nevertheless, the amendments are not enough to cater the actual demand that Sabah and Sarawak have concerning financial allocation and also resource autonomy. Sabah and Sarawak, as we know, is the resource-rich state simply do not have the same level of economic growth at their financial contribution to the federal government as both are resource-rich territory that remarkably contribute to the Malaysia exports. For example, Sabah is the country top producer of crude oil, while Sarawak is the top exporter of the dissatisfaction of the East Malaysian came from the inequitable sharing of resources and lack of fiscal federalism. Many critics allege that the federal government do not take into account the huge direct and indirect federal and then gain from these two Borneo state resources, especially in oil and gas, petroleum, hydroelectricity and tourism aspect in allocating federal funds in development and economy of this state. So a major and intricate complaint is that Sabah does not receive the mandatory financial allocation that is due to it under the 10th schedule. In 1963, 34% of the Dewan Rakyat members of parliament were from Sabah and Sarawak and Singapore and had the power to veto any constitutional amendment and this proportion has now gone down to 25%. The discontentment seems to be growing at an alarming state where in 2021, the former Deputy Chief Minister Second and now the current Deputy Chief Minister One of Sabah, Datuk Sri Jeffrey Kittingen, claimed there was a growing movement for secession and wished that 60% of East Malaysians want Sabah and Sarawak to secede from Malaysia as they were disappointed with development fund allocated in budget 2022. In his statement, he pointed out the disparity in the national plan which allocated only 9.8 billion for Sabah and Sarawak compared to 67.8 billion received by Peninsula Malaysia. So the dissatisfaction continues as de despite being the largest producer of crude oil in Malaysia, Sabah remains the poorest and the underdeveloped state along with Sarawak in our country. So recently, the problem patterning the failure of the federal government to ensure the level of autonomy uh, agreed upon in Malaysia Agreement 1963 has been addressed by our current Prime Minister, Dr. Sri Anwar Ibrahim, where he vows to do his best to resolve the M863 issue that shook the relationship between the federal government and two Borneo states government for quite a long period of time. The Prime Minister also added that he had already announced uh, for that federal funded project costing up to 50 million to be handled directly by the public sewer department of Sabah and Sarawak instead of going through the federal bureaucracy without having to go through the federal approving agency as many of the projects in Sabah and Sarawak had been delayed due to the bureaucracy in coming to a decision from the federal government. So this uh, initiative is the first step to show that the government was serious in committing to the Malaysian Agreement 1963 and it depicts that the federal government is aware of the issue arise from the dispute between them and the local government of Sabah and Sarawak. So, in a nutshell, the special constitutional status granted by this constitution to the Malay and the native of Sabah Sarawak give them exceptional privilege and right in terms of reservation of quotas in respect of public services, permits, scholarship and placement in education institutions. For example, reservation of educational placement to the Bumi Putras in University Technology Malaysia. So this special status works as a protection as it uh, safeguard uh, their status quo as a Bumi Putra. So nevertheless, there are challenges such as discrimination and inequality issue that may arise and be faced, which probably affects the harmonious and good relationship among the stakeholders as we know that Malaysia was a, is a multiracial country. So as for the native uh, in Sabah and Sarawak, the federal government may propose new amendment to symbol symbolically restoring the status and dignity of Sabah and Sarawak within the Malaysian constitutional order. So in any event, the Malaysian government will have to go beyond to address the, the source of dissatisfaction, which is the autonomy of the territories over their political features and 
the returns of their resources so that it will uh, it hopefully would allow for stronger protection of the native right thank you